My name is Kevin Murphy, and I'm the son of uh, Francis Murphy, also known as Sunner, um, who was the last real skipper of the Rio Grande. And uh, the, the boat's been in the family for a long time, and uh, I'm actually um, fourth generation that fished on it, and there was one additional generation. So there's five generations that fished on the boat, oh, but yeah. I was in the fourth generation that was on the boat. So then one of your kids, or was it? It was my nephew, your nephew. that okay. fished on it, yeah. Okay. Briefly. Cool. And then, Ben, what's your uh, relationship with the Rio? A uh, friend of the family. Okay, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're excited to have you both here. I mean, even, even before we got started, it seemed like you guys uh, could really tell some stories back and forth. So I'm glad that Ben's here and uh, you know, might be able to goose some more questions for us here to ask you, Kevin. So, um, so then what is, we'll start with what your, your personal story with fishing. Because I know that you've fished not just on the Rio. I know you've been involved with other fisheries. So let's talk about that a little bit. As far as fishing goes, um, I started my fishing career on the Rio when I was 11 years old. And that would have been the summer of 72 and fish with my granddad, Spike Murphy and filed web on the boat uh, alongside the other guys working. And I spent almost every summer from there until my mid to late twenties uh, fishing on the boat. Um, we fished salmon, seining um, predominantly. We did a little shrimp here and there, a little halibut here and there, but mostly just salmon seining. So I, I misspent my youth on that boat. <laughs> And then, um, but you fish beyond just the Rio as well. I, so I spent a couple of summers fishing with a, a guy out of Seattle, Al Coles, on the Jamie C, which okay. was one of the first big steel Hansons okay. built. And I fished southeast with him in 86 and Falls Pass, Area M, in 87. Okay. But that's pretty much been the extent. I, I still do some halibut now with a local guy, go out on his boat. But, okay. Yeah. Mostly it's been on the Rio. Well, I fished with Harold Haynes on the Chesina Bay and the Ole H off and on. And I, I still, the last two summers I've gone as a relief uh, for guys. I've gone out on the North Cape with Ole Haynes. And then this last summer I went one opening on the Doxa with mm -hmm. a young skipper a couple weeks before he sank the boat. So I still, I still yeah. go out occasionally just to remind myself why I don't want to do it for a living. <laughs> well, that fits into a, a later question I have, which was what keeps you going out? That's it. Yeah. I, it. You know, most fishermen will tell you that once it gets in the blood, there's no cure for it. Mm -hmm. um, when my dad was getting close to retirement, um, I started shopping for a replacement boat for the Rio because it was getting pretty tired yeah. and needed to retire. Um, but I just could not pencil out the finances to justify that kind of investment the way the salmon industry has been going. And that, the last year my dad fished was in 2013, which was his best season ever. But it went downhill after that. And the last couple years have been really poor. Thankfully this year they had a much better season. But I still could not pencil it out. And, but I, I love the idea of it. I like being out. I, one of my favorite things in the world is, is that morning before the opening, getting up at daylight, which is two thirty, three o'clock in the morning, having morning coffee, looking for jumps, waiting to go fishing. And there is nothing like it in the world. There's no place I'd rather be at the time. Yeah. Perfect. So back to the Rio. Um, you know, the basics. What history do you know of her when she was built? Who built her? <clears throat> um, I, I've heard stories over the years from my dad and my granddad uh, as the history of the boat and when they got it. And I've tried to reconfirm some of that and I did some research on it yesterday again. The boat was originally built um, by Barbie Shipyards in Seattle. It was on Lake Union. Uh, it was built for a gentleman that I believe was from Anacortes. 
and his last name was Surian, S-U-R-Y-A-N, and they're a famous fishing family. And it was built to go to False Pass, up in the Aleutians, and Sane up there. It was built in 1931. Um, the boat was originally probably started in 1930, and there was two ships, two boats being built in the shipyard, and it caught fire, and the hulls were destroyed. And Rio was one of them. I don't know what the other sister ship was that was being built. Um, so then she was rebuilt and launched in 1931. Um, my great-grandfather bought the boat in 1935, and he was a uh, owner of a fish trap back in the heyday. And I give you history on him, but long story short, um, he came from Nova Scotia in 1901 with four brothers, came to Alaska to fish codfish out of dories in the Bering Sea. And they worked their way south to the gold camps. Um, my grandfather was born in the gold camps in Porcupine District uh, outside of Haines in 1911. And then they worked their way south. My great-grandfather worked in the gold mines in Juneau with the Treadwell. He was a machinist. They moved to Tenneke and they became hand trollers. And my granddad would fish with my great-granddad, row in the skiff for him as they were hand trollers. The story in the family is, is that my great-grandfather was hired with another guy to log and build a fish trap for a gentleman. And that required the use of really big logs, long trees, and a lot of work. As he and this other gentleman were being paid to build a fish trap for the guy that hired him, he logged enough trees to build one for himself. <laughs> and so he built himself a fish trap and then got a, a permitted location for it, which is near Myers Chuck, between Ship Island and Myers Chuck. And uh, my daughter found a, a map that had the coordinates of it. And from, from the, it was a chart that had the location of all the fish traps. And it was the F.H. Murphy Fish Company. So he operated the trap for a few years and then needed a boat to, to tend to the traps. So that's what the Rio was originally purchased for, was tending the traps. Of course, when the traps were outlawed at statehood, no more tending in the traps. Mm -hmm. In the buildup to that, they also uh, would use it as a towboat. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they'd tow in the wintertime, tend the traps in the summertime, until statehood, when the traps were outlawed, then they rigged up for seining. And so they continued to seine. Um, and then in the 70s, my granddad and my dad uh, were some of the pioneers for the black cod pot fishery in Southeast. Uh, Virgil Gordon was another guy at the, at the time. Rudy Johansson um, was another gentleman. And between that group, they pretty much started that black cod pot fishery. And she fished black cod for quite a few years. I remember as a teenager, teenager going out on the boat and fishing black cod with them. And we'd be bringing in, in the wintertime, 35,000 pounds a week, pretty much steady. Um, and then when that went limited entry, or IFQs, my dad and my granddad were partners in the operation, but all the fish tickets were in my granddad's name. So my dad did not get a permit for that, which is a shame. But So she fished black cod uh, in the 70s, um, and then pretty much from then on, just strictly um, seining and then some freight work. That's where, where Ben kind of comes in is my dad would uh, would haul freight for friends and stuff. And Ben has a cabin over in Chomley Sound and uh, pretty much everything there for the cabin was hauled over on everything the, on the Rio. Everything went on the Rio. <laughs> but he would, he would do all kinds of freight work with it. Um, I remember um, traveling up to Tenneke, haul freight up to Tenneke um, for family members that were up there and did some log salvage work with it, towing. And one of the other things he did with it, he'd retrieve broken helicopters for Kenny Eichner. <laughs> Anytime they'd crash one, he'd go out and pick up the pieces. I hope that wasn't regular work. It actually happened more than you would want. But they weren't always, you know, 
total wrecks. I, I remember one time uh, Kenny asked us to go to Mount Edgecombe up by Sitka and pick up a, it was a, a model of helicopter that you don't see around much anymore. It was, but it was one that Kenny had started Temsco with. It was a Hiller E model. And this one had inflatable floats on it. And they'd lost an engine and the pilot was able to put it on the beach with no damage to it. And so we went up to pick it up and we go to Sitka and it was beautiful, it was in winter time. We go up there and it's a real long sandy beach and we get there at low tide and the helicopter's up at the high tide line. Well, Kenny had flown up in a Hughes 500 and he didn't want to wait around for the tide to come in. So we took a strap around the mast of the helicopter and hooked it up to Kenny on the 500 and he pulled as much power past red line as he could and it was just enough to lift it up where we could push it down the beach and then he'd have to roll off the power. And then <laughs> he'd lift it up again, my dad and I'd push it down the beach. Lift up again, push it down the beach. Finally, we floated it out to the boat, put it on the Rio, and then came back to town for it. But the Rio has hauled a lot of broken helicopters, a lot of disabled float planes. I mean, it, whenever there was a problem going on where, you know, emergency or search and rescue or something like that, he was always, you know, first one there. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> so that's pretty much the history of the boat. We retired the boat in... Um, 13 was his last season. I think 15 was a year we put it on the beach. Mm -hmm. We gave it a, a final resting spot out at Murphy's Landing. Yeah. Just dug a hole for it and, and ran it up on the beach and there she sits. Yeah. Um, so of course you've answered a ton of these questions I have, so <laughs> I have to <laughs> look, at, look through these again. But, um, oh, so th I think this is, a great question because not everyone that's going to listen to this or hear it has any idea. What, in the simplest terms, what is saying? Saying. Yeah. Well, saying, and there's a lot of different species of, of fish that get saned from tuna, the super saners, sardines, anchovies, any fish that will school up, herring, you can, you can sane those fish. And seining in Southeast Alaska uh, is the use of a net that is 250 fathoms long, 1,500 feet long. And the state of Alaska has a um, maximum depth and they don't go by inches or feet, they go by number of meshes. And 450 meshes is the, the legal depth limit of an Alaskan salmon seine. So you go out when the, and most of the time it's going to be along a shoreline because uh, it's where the fish kind of shallow up and travel in larger schools. And so the, the larger boat, the mothership, the Rio, would carry the net and had a smaller boat, the Seine skiff, that would tow on the other end of it. So they drop the net off and you would hold kind of a semicircle uh, and normally a, that's called a set, setting the net. So you would set the net, uh, the fish would swim into it, you'd hold it open for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, close it up. And in the old days, it was called full pursing. It had on the bottom of the net, there was a lead line, a weighted lead line, and then rings, and a purse line ran through all the rings. So when you close the two ends of the net together, full purse would pull from either side of the net. So on two lines, connected in the middle, you would purse the bottom up like a purse string. And then you'd lift that whole works up onto the deck and then finish hauling the gear through the power block in the, in the later days. Nowadays they do what's called half purse, which the purse line runs out from one end of the net, 150 fathoms out. So as they close the end of the net together, they start hauling the end of the net that's on the boat end. They start running that through the power block while they're pursing up and you meet in the middle, mm -hmm. and it's much faster, much easier yeah. than the old days. When the Rio first started fishing, they didn't have power blocks. So they had what was called a turntable, and it was a platform built on the stern of the boat that would rotate, and it had a roller. And the guys would just annually pull the nets in by hand, seven, eight guys on the turntable. Mm -hmm. Well, then they got real fancy. 
they put power to the roller. <laughs> but they still had to pull it in by hand. Yeah. <clears throat> and then they invented the power block. And in the, on the reel, the early power blocks weren't hydraulic like they are now. They were powered by rope. So you had a, a rope that went to the power block on the end of the boom, down to the deck winch. And the deck winch powered the power block. And the deck winch was powered by the engine. The, and the deck winch was powered usually by a power takeoff off the main engine, and it was all shafts and gears and chains. Okay. No hydraulics. So I remember as a, as a teenager, our deck winch was still powered by shafts and chains and it hung down in the lower part of the fish hole. And when we had to unload fish, we would sit there and pitch fish individually into a, a brailer. And I remember, I don't know how many times I'd hit my head on that sprocket and chain from underneath. <laughs> but that, that's essentially what seining is. It's the use of a net 2,500 feet long, no, 1,500 feet long, excuse me, 1,500 feet long. Um, and the technology of, of it has come a long way in the last, since I was fishing in the mid 70s. New materials, new nets, everything's bigger, stronger, faster. We used to think that when we were full pursing, 30 minutes was a good amount of time to get the net back. Yeah. Now, 10 minutes. I mean, that's, that's a standard that everybody shoots for, is 10 minute recovery now on, mm -hmm. on nets. And so, how? How many crew is normal now, and what are their jobs aboard? So, when I first started, we had, uh, I'm trying to think, we had the skipper, the skiff man, the deck boss, and three guys in a pile. Mm -hmm. So, usually six was the, the number of crew. Some of the boats had seven or eight guys on them. And when I went out this last summer, there was four of us total. And, the, and one guy in the skiff, the skipper, one guy, no, two guys in a pile. And that was it. So most of the time, guys will fish with five nowadays. So the, the amount of crew is reduced. Um, so the crew tasks or positions on it is, of course, the skipper decides everything that goes on. The skiff man is usually your next most experienced person because there's a lot of responsibility that goes with that and he operates the same skiff as they're towing the net. Once the, the net closes up, the skiff man puts a tow line to the main boat and then keeps it on track out of the net. And so his job isn't, I mean, he's working all the time. And then the other job is in a boat, depending on how guys configure their crews, um, it's usually two guys piling gear, and then the skipper will, and maybe one other guy will work the deck. When I first started fishing, there was three guys in the pile. Um, but the boats are so much bigger now, the net doesn't take up hardly any room at all on the stern of the boat. But it used to be that you had three guys in a pile, piling corks, piling web, and piling leads. And you had to separate those out as they came down to be able to reset the net. Yeah, so now on a bigger boat, you're not as concerned where things go, so those two people can manage So it. several things have, have happened. The hydraulics have gotten so much more powerful mm -hmm. and more versatile. So in the old days, when they put the power block out on the end of the boom, that was it. That's the only position that it had. And the boom was held up to the mast by a block and tackle system that was oftentimes just rope. So if you had to move the boom up and down, you had to go up and slack the line and then try and pull it back up. Nowadays, everything is alive. There's a hydraulic winch for everything. So the boom is live. It'll go up and down. It'll bang side to side. And then the um, guys have come up with different methods of moving the block position. A lot of times it's a slider. Uh, there's also hydraulic knuckle booms that'll move. And so one guy on a hydraulic bank can control where the net lands on the stern of the boat. Mm -hmm. So the big key now is to keep the net from tangling. So that's why you have somebody in the corks and somebody in the leads. And then the, whoever's working the hydraulics will position the block so that the web just piles up and doesn't end up a big haystack. Yeah. So you don't really need a web man anymore. 
Um, oh, I had a question in there, but now I've lost it. That was awesome. Well, can I ask a yeah. question? No, yeah. I can, sure. Please do feel free, because I know Ben's over there and probably knows a little bit about this too. Um, can you then describe like some of those earlier photos or accounts of the Rio Grande? How did it visibly change from like 1931 to how it's on the beach now? I mean, you're talking about all these technological you know, updates. Did it change fundamentally? Like, sure. I, I <clears throat> originally, um, the, the the way the deck house is on it, right now it's all at one level. And in the 50s, uh, my granddad changed that um, from where the galley part of the boat, where the, the crew prepped the food and ate, that was on the main deck level. So the house had a step in it. And he raised the galley up off the main deck to the forward four deck level. So the wheelhouse and the galley and the stateroom were all on one level. So that's one big visual. Um, of course, they didn't have the turn. Well, they had the turntable on it originally because it, it sane salmon up in false pass. When my great granddad bought the boat, they took the turntable off. So that was gone. Um, Although they were able, they, they still had a way to put the turntable back on because in the late 30s and 40s, the Rio Saint Herring in front of town in the wintertime. And there are some pictures of it um, with a big set of herring right in front of the old Ketchikan coal storage. Uh, and Didn't it have the portholes in the hall in that photo? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's one of the other physical changes that had. I'll, I'll get, get back to that one in a minute. So in the, in the wintertime, they would do bait herring, bait and food herring, and they'd make a set right in front of the coal storage, bring the boat and the net right up to the coal storage, and take the fish right out of the net into the coal storage. Um, what, one of the other physical changes that Ben mentioned, um, I, be, I think it was between the main guard and the rub rail, it used to have a series of portholes on either side of the boat. And uh, there are pictures of it that have the portholes in it. And I don't know, that was probably back in the 50s when they did the house change, mm -hmm. they took the portholes out. Um, yeah. There's another older boat around town, the Gene D, mm -hmm. which is similar in shape. It's not a sister ship to it, but it was built off the drawings of oh. the Rio. Um, she still has the portholes in it. So that's an idea of how the Rio looked at the time. Um, other physical changes you used to have a wooden mast, wooden boom. Um, my dad built a steel mast, steel boom for it. Um, put two extra picking booms on it, steel picking booms on it. Uh, other than that, the overall appearance of the boat hasn't changed since the 50s. But from the 30s to the 50s, it had that, that one significant change where they changed the house on it. I guess one of the other ones, and, and um, when she was built, and it was common practice in the day in the 30s, um, it didn't have a fixed flying bridge on it. What they what they did, and you see pictures of old ships, they had a, a pipe rail system that they would cover in canvas. Mm -hmm. And I still have a bunch of those brass pipe rail fittings from the old days, because she had a pipe rail flying bridge with canvas, and then pipe rails up the forward bulwarks. And I've, I've got a whole stack of those that I, I don't know what I'm gonna do with, but they're cool. Yeah, <laughs> I'll take them. <laughs> so uh, I wonder, did they do that with the canvas so that it could be removed for wind or? I don't know, it, probably a couple, and I'm just speculating. Yeah. Um, it could be removed, could be changed. Uh, it was probably lighter in weight than wood. Mm -hmm. So it helped with the stability of the vessel. Yeah. Um, and that was just the way they did things. Um, you know, from that progression, they, they went to plywood, and then my dad went to aluminum, but a lot of the older wooden boats have had top houses put on them. Um, my dad never wanted to put a top house on because he thought it would destroy the looks of the boat. And there are very few boats of that vintage that a boat with a top house doesn't destroy the looks of it. Right. So. But the guys were tougher back then. <laughs> they didn't mind being out in the weather. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, 
you're doing such a great job taking off all my boxes here. <laughs> um, you know, one and you know you've addressed this a little bit, but what makes her unique? Is there um, anything besides what you've mentioned that makes her stand out? Well, a couple of things. I, she has classic lines, and when my granddad had the boat, he he lived right there, had the boat tied up out in front, and he would spend all winter work on the boat. That was his day's work. He would have his morning coffee and breakfast down on the boat, taking care of the boat. So when it came time in the springtime to get do the boat maintenance, there really wasn't a lot to do. Um, I remember as a teenager, every summer we would take the paint down to bare wood. We would use propane burners, <clears throat> scrape off all the old paint, sand all the hardwood, and add, add hardwood caps and guards and everything else, billboards where the anchor came up. And we would take that all down and redo it. And she was one of the prettiest boats in the fleet. And the color combination that my granddad had come up with um, between the the white and the gray and the green was very unique. There weren't many boats that were painted in that, that way. Either it was all white with you know, a stripe on it or it was painted some other solid color, but this was a very unique paint job and, and she always shined. So between just the visual aspect of it being here and, and the condition that it was kept in, and then the fact that it was here for, you know, so long yeah. from 1935 on it just became a fixture of Ketchikan and the southeast community mm -hmm. and there's so many people that either have experiences on the boat either working on the boat or um, even you know they used to tow around the logging camps when the logging camps were on float so people would get to know the boat and, and my granddad and my dad through the operation of the boat and if you tried to, you know, the seven degrees of separation thing, hundreds of thousands of people yeah. <laughs> right. have been touched by experiences on the real ground. <laughs> and, and I think that that's such a great, like, you know, the times that I've had with boats and I, you know, just going down the channel, anybody going by is going to hail us on the radio and have a story for us. And so I know you must have a pocket full of hundreds of stories. And so it's a question that I, I ask um captains and about boats is you know has anyone ever shared a story with you of course we it has to be like what is your favorite story or do you, you i know? have a, i have a favorite story but yeah. i would like kevin to tell it <laughs> actually i have several <laughs> but my favorite uh, my favorite of all time if you will please is uh 1964. Well, the 64 quake. So 1964, Alaska had a big earthquake that did a lot of damage up north. And there was uh, tsunami warnings down the west coast. Brookings, Oregon got demolished by the Alaska quake tidal wave. My granddad and his crew, uh, my dad, Rich Andrews, was on the boat. Um, they were towing logs out of Carroll Inlet. And Middle of the night, they, uh, they're steaming along, towing logs, and all of a sudden they're going backwards. And they couldn't figure out what was going on. And then all of a sudden, whoosh, they're shooting, really making speed. And they woke up in the morning and there was rockfish floating around everywhere. They rode out that tsunami <laughs> on the boat and didn't even know what was going on. They didn't didn't have radios on, they didn't know there was a quake, didn't know there was a tsunami warning if they'd ever had such a thing in 64. But they wrote out the 64 quake in, in Carol Inlet. <laughs> That's crazy. It's my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've got so many stories, I mean, of, of uh, near tragedies, tragedies, <laughs> fun times. <laughs> um, wow, where to begin? Um, well, we're hoping to also interview, uh, you know, Rich and Kay. So if oh, there are some rich related stories that you want to, you know, have the first word on. <laughs> well, Rich, Rich and my dad were friends forever since Rich came to town back in the 50s when his family moved here. In fact, Rich lived with my grandparents for a while. 
because his folks moved back south and and Rich really didn't want to be south, so he moved with my grand. So he and my dad were like brothers, closer than brothers, closer than my brother and I ever were. <laughs> um, but I'll leave those stories to Rich. <laughs> Um, stories of the real. Wow. I can think of times where I was really happy to be on it and times where I wish I was somewhere else. We used to pack herring out of Cachecs for the gillnet fishery. And uh, when the Rio was built, it didn't have a tanked fish hold. It was a dry hold, uh, which was common in the day because there was no refrigerated seawater, anything like that. Um, before we put the tank in, um, it was a dry hold, but the hole would drain into the bilge, and then it had bilge pumps, both electric and manual, and it was a diaphragm. The manual was a diaphragm pump, and had a big steel bar for a handle, and there's a few boats that still have them around. Um, but to pump the bilge with the, with the diaphragm pump, you had to put the steel bar in, and then just pull a prime, and then manually pump on it and it took a lot of work we got a load of herring and cachecs and we were packing for a guy that was selling the herring in prince rupert in the middle of the night in a storm we had to head for prince rupert and it was nasty and we had a 18 foot aluminum boat lashed down on the stern of the rio we were taking big enough waves over the stern that that boat was floating around the fish hold, the hatch cover, the fish hold was not sealed. So all that water was going into the hold, into the bilge. My brother and I spent that entire night in a storm on deck, pumping a bilge to keep it from sinking. Didn't want to be there. <laughs> that was one time we almost lost the boat. Oh, right in the middle of it, the boat takes a real hard left turn and we're laying in the trough. Dad thought we'd broken a hydraulic line, the steering had gone out, mayday, mayday, mayday. I mean, it was nasty. And we're laying right in the trough. And it turns out that in the rough weather, something had fallen against the gyro compass for the autopilot and knocked it out of whack. So all he had to do was shut off the <laughs> autopilot and hand steer, get us going again. But we didn't know. Yeah. We're just steaming along in pitch black and 25 foot seas. All of a sudden, we're laying in the trough of it. Didn't want to be there. No. <laughs> I remember one time pulling log. We were towing logs uh, out of Bean Canal, uh, West Bean. <clears throat> Middle of the night, we're towing a big raft out of the Eunuch River. That was when my dad was partners with Dick Hamlin in the, the log business. And we're, it was just my dad and I, and we're towing logs doing four or five knots, just chugging along. And the sleeping quarters for the crew were down in the forecastle, had five bunks down there. And I was down in the forecastle asleep. Dad was on watch by himself. And I remember middle of the night having to get up to, to go pee. And I jump out of the bunk and I'm knee deep in water. Not a good thing. I come out of the hatch in front of the wheelhouse and dad, we're taking on water. He opens the engine room hatch, jerry jugs floating around in the engine room, water levels about halfway up the engine, about maybe four to six inches away from the intake on the engine. What had happened was it was a raw water cooled engine, so it would pump seawater in through the heat exchanger and pump it overboard. But a piece of hose in the overboard had split, so it was just pumping water through the engine into the engine room. No bilge alarm, nothing like that. Almost lost the boat there. <laughs> you made a great bilge alarm that day. Oh yeah, yeah was, <laughs> thank God I had to get up and pee. <laughs> um, well, can I ask, I mean, as you're ruminating over some of those, since it is one of your favorite stories, of, you know, about the earthquake and everything, you would have been a small kid unless my math's super wrong. When did you hear the story first? Probably, I remember hearing the story before it even went fishing on the boat. So it was before I was 11. And I, and I heard it many times over the years. 
So what were they doing out in Carroll Inlet whenever that earthquake happened? They were towing logs oh, no. for the Commodore. Commodore Bird. Yeah. He was a logger that had an operation up there. Like I say, they, they used to spend a lot of time in the wintertime towing, whether it's log floats, logs, floating camps, all kinds of stuff. They actually had two propellers they had for the boat. One was a speed prop for seining, and the other was a power prop with less pitch in it for the wintertime, and they'd put the boat on the grid or pull it up in the yard and uh, change the props out for what, what job they were doing. Mm -hmm. um, since we have you here, and, um, you know, Murphy's Landing has to have a history all on its own. It, what can you tell us about, about the landing and when you guys got that and how um, well, a bit of that history too? My great grandfather uh, established F.H. Murphy Fish Company in 1924 at Murphy's Landing. And at the time, um, they built a warehouse, had an apartment in it, and dock. And then there was a, a residential house uh, very near to it. My earliest memories of, of that property have the, the warehouse with two warehouse sections and then the dock out in front of it and then what was my grandparents' house. My great-granddad passed before I was born, so I never met him. Um, and it was all Tideland area. Uh, there was no upland property at all. Um, so the, the house was built on piling, the warehouse was built on piling, and even the road down to the warehouse from the house was on piling, and it was a wood deck that went down. And I remember that as a kid. And I remember on the right-hand side going down my, was my dad's welding shop, which was probably 20 by 30 single story building. And that was where, and my dad, was a pretty good machinist in his own right without any formal training. Um, so that's where my great-grandfather would keep the fish trap. There's a real shallow cove up on the south side of it and they would tie the fish trap up for the winter. They would tow it to town from up by Myers Chuck and they would um, let it sit for the winter and kind of dry out a little bit. It would go dry, it would kill all the bugs that were in the logs. Um, and then they had a bunch of different piling driven in support of that operation. I had a real interesting experience this summer. These two guys drive down and they said, do you mind if we go take a look down on the corner of the property? Well, that's an odd request. I said, well, when we were about 12 years old, um, our dad had a scow, wooden barge, with a house on it, and we lived here. And Spike Murphy let my dad tie up to the old fish trap. And these guys were like in their 70s, right? And so they started telling me stories about them as teenagers living on a, on a scow at Murphy's Landing back before there was really ever anything else there other than a warehouse and a house. Um, my, my dad started doing the fill project. Uh, he would get an occasional load of rock here or there. My dad was kind of cheap in a lot of ways. So if he could get a load of free rock, he'd get a load of free rock. Um, so there was a little bit of filled it in area between the house and the warehouse. Um, about 25, 30 years ago, they did the highway widening project out there. And through some friends of mine, I got us on the list of waste sites for shot rock. And my dad was supposed to do the Corps of Engineers permit for that and I kept checking with him hey how's that going you know they've got all this rock available and we stockpiled as much as we could but we didn't have, we didn't weren't permitted to put it in the tideland area and finally I called the state and I said I want to check on the status of this permit and, and they go well, we don't have any application for that <laughs> he'd been stringing me along hadn't done anything on it so we missed all the free rock that we could have had. So dealing with that, I finally I filed for the per permit. Of course, the project was done. Rock source was gone. <clears throat> so I bought some property across the highway. And we blasted out 50,000 cubic yards of rock, moved that across the highway, and developed Murphy's Landing into to what it is today. And that was a little over 25 years ago. Um, 
because I remember we had just finished that when my oldest child was born. <laughs> and she just turned 25. Um, and then over the, the next 20 plus years, my dad decided to fill it up with all kinds of treasures. And I spent the last three years cleaning up those treasures. <laughs> so that's, and, and it's, uh, now it's a, it's a prime piece of waterfront property. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure what I'll do with it. <laughs> I, I, it's been in the family for almost 100 years. I, I don't really want to get it out of the family, but I don't necessarily have a use for that much heavy industrial waterfront. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, so you mentioned about your gut spike and your father. Uh, your great-grandfather, what was his name? His name was Frank Herman Murphy. That's the F-H in the Murphy fish. Oh. And the spike is really... S spike was... Uh, Francis Charles Murphy, okay. and my father was Francis Charles Murphy Jr. And yours was Francis Kevin. <laughs> no, nope. my bro my brother, oh. older my older brother was Francis Charles Murphy the oh. third, but he passed in eighty nine, okay. and I just ended up Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so to, to to go more into to Frank. Yeah, Murphy, if you wouldn't mind, he was he was known as Gramps. That's he, he was always referred to in, in my lifetime as Gramps. Um, there's a few guys around town that knew Gramps. Ronnie Porter is one of them. He, he grew up next door to Murphy's Landing. So he spent a lot of time with Gramps, and I've learned, learned some things from there. Gramps and his four brothers came from Nova Scotia. They were an efficient family in Nova Scotia um, on the eastern shore. But things had kind of gone bad for fishing there. So they signed on a schooner out of Frisco, took a train to Frisco, headed for the Bering Sea. And they spent a few years at the cod stations up in the Bering Sea. <clears throat> then they worked their way south through the gold fields. And none of the brothers ever returned to stay in Canada. They just kind of spread through southeast. Uh, I know Charles, he was out on the west coast as a troller. Um, Jack stayed in the Juneau area. Uh, Nate, one of the brothers, ended up a big game guide up in Lake Atlin, British Columbia. Um, I'm trying to think of the other. George was the other brother, and I, and I think he stayed in the Juneau area as well. And then Frank was in Tenneke and then Ketchikan. So um, it, he was a very successful guy. He had a big, big house here in town, um, which burned a few years ago, and they actually rebuilt it in the same spot in a very similar place um, it, and it's above where Lutheran Church is mm -hmm. that was Captain's Hill yeah. up there right well he had like the house farthest up the hill when they built the house there was no road up there so they built a tramway to haul all the materials up um, I'm trying to think of the family that's in it now they were in it when it burned and they rebuilt it it'll come to me but it was, it was a, a really big house on the hill. And then um, he moved out of that. Um, his health was getting poor. And so he moved into the apartment, into the warehouse, and my granddad oh. and my grandmother kind of took care of him until he passed. But from all accounts, he was, he was quite a guy. I mean, he was very talented. He was a machinist, um, fisherman, entrepreneur. <laughs> And he kind of started things for the Murphys in Southeast. Let's see. Oh, so, you know, this one might not be the best one to sort of end things on, but, you know, how, and you've touched on a lot of points, especially the technology, but how has the industry changed in your lifetime when it comes to fishing? A couple of things. The efficiency of the catcher boats has improved tremendously. Um, the state instituted a length limit on boats, um, 58 feet for same boats. And that was fine. That was a way to control the amount of fish that could be caught. Right? You have a boat, the Rio, state of the art in its day. After we put the refrigerated seawater tank in it, she could pack. 35 to 38,000 pounds, which was a really good day's fishing. Yeah. 
we very rarely deck loaded the boat. Nowadays, they're still building 58 foot long boats, but they're 26 feet wide with a draft 12 feet. They'll carry 200,000 pounds. And so the technology for the catcher boats is unbelievable. The quality of the fish has improved tremendously. Um, I, I remember as a teenager, unrefrigerated hold on a hot August day with a load of humpies in a hole. And we're down there pitching them out one by one into a brailer. Standing on top of them? Standing on top of them. And usually three guys in a hole, 300 fish to a brailer. So you're down there and there's slime and jellyfish and this nasty smell. And you're pitching as fast as you can. It's always a race to see who can pitch your 100 first. And you get that done because if you pitch fast, you can take a break longer. The bottom couple thousand fish, nasty, nasty looking things. Just soft, limp, squashed piles of meat. Still went in a can of cannery. I wouldn't eat a canned pink salmon back then for nothing. Nowadays, fish come out of the cold seawater, they go into cold seawater, they get pumped out of the boat by a big vacuum pump into refrigerated seawater, then into the plane. The quality of the catch is much, much, much better. So that, those are probably the two biggest things. Being a fisherman and being a saner is still a rough way to make a living. It, it's, in many ways, it's similar to being a farmer. There are so many forces out of your control that have an impact on if you make a living or not. The last couple of years, saners have been just dying, especially in Southeast. It's been really, really poor. I talked to one this last spring before the season, and he was telling me, he says, I hope we have a really bad season. Apparently there was some sort of a government rescue program that if they had three bad seasons in a row, they were eligible for some disaster relief of some kind. But if they had a good season, they'd have to start that count over again. So he was, he was actually hoping for another bad season. <laughs> well, they had one of the, I think the 14th best seasons on record. Yeah. So, they, but it's still, it's a rough way of making a living. And one, I guess one of the other big changes is back when I was growing up and fishing with my granddad, you had guys on the boat that were professional crew members. I mean, they, they would go either from boat to boat or they would stay with a skipper for years and years. Um, and they had skills. They could stand wheel watches, they had mechanical skills, they could mend web, splice rope. They were really good on, to people to have on a boat. The other crew members that you had were usually college students. And it's amazing how many college educations fishing in, in Alaska has paid for. Nowadays, it's a struggle to find crew. And I, I don't know whether it's because the money has been so bad that those guys have moved on to do other things, or there's, and now I'm one of the older guys that, oh yeah, young people don't have any work ethic at all. But that's part of it is nobody wants to work that hard anymore. Or not very many people mm -hmm. want to work that hard anymore. And it's a tough way of making a living. Um, I remember the first year I went out, I went for half a share. Because I was 11 years old, I wasn't worthy of a full share. I made $1,200 for the season. Yeah. But 11 year old kid in 1972, I was filthy rich. The next year I went out for a full share, I made $800. And that wasn't uncommon. We had just over 10,000 fish for the season. Now, if you don't catch 10,000 fish, you know, in, in the first couple of sets in the morning, you're not having a good day. And we fished five, six, seven days a week back then. So we worked hard for what, what we got. But trying to find decent crew that wants to learn the business and wants to develop skills where they're valuable, every, almost every boat this summer was looking for crew. And, uh, and there were times where guys had to stay tied up in town because they couldn't find crew. So I think one of the, the big
biggest things that communities could do is have some kind of a program where they can take some of the young people from town and give them the skills necessary to be able to go out on a boat and be useful. I, I mentioned earlier, I went fishing this summer with a fellow that, young fellow, good fisherman, local kid. He's gonna be a good fisherman, but he's young and, and he made a few mistakes. Um, but he had a crew on a boat that he couldn't trust to do much of anything. They would pile gear like a couple of trained monkeys. That was it. What happened when he sunk the boat is they had unloaded some fish. He was running back to, to, <clears throat> to the fishing grounds because he didn't have any crew on the boat that could stand the wheel watch. He tried to push it. He fell asleep at the wheel, hit the beach, sunk the boat. And that happens because he couldn't find any crew. Mm -hmm. So that one of the other big changes is <clears throat> you can't find, it's very difficult to find really good crew anymore. I know guys that, do you remember Ray Ray Denny? <clears throat> he was so. skiff, skiff man for Ronnie Porter, big red. He was a local native fellow, <clears throat> catch can boy, best skiff man around in his day. And he was big. I mean, Ray Ray filled up a doorway when he went through it. But he'd get in the skiff in the morning and he wouldn't get out <laughs> until they were done fishing for the day. But he stuck with Ronnie. He, he must have been with him for 15 years. And, and my dad had, and my granddad had guys like that that would stay with him for years and years and years. And now every summer it's like, well, I've got to find some crew. Yeah, I think Tosh had four St. Alfred's this summer. <laughs> Well, can I ask, because I know, um, you know, Brooke kind of has extinguished her questions. Are you game for a couple of catch a can questions sure. or just in general? Um, so, I mean, your family's been involved in catch a can for so, such a long time, which you've kind of outlined. Um, can you talk a little bit about how catch a can has changed? Just, you know, from the time you were a kid here. It ain't the place I grew up. In, in what ways? Um, it was a blue collar town. It was... Uh, fishing and logging, and that was pretty much it. There were uh, a lot of resources, uh, shipyards around town that supported the fishing industry. Um, the mill came in just shortly before I was born, so I grew up with a pulp mill in town as the, the big blue collar employer. Uh, I know my brother worked there off and on quite a few years. My dad worked on the on the waterfront there, usually as, as a strike breaker. He ran the tugs, uh, the Tonga cell for the mill whenever they would have a shutdown or or they'd be on strike or something. And so he'd go in and, and run uh, run the tug for them. We had the spruce mill in town. Mm -hmm. And my dad ran the uh, E.W. Borgen, the little tug that the spruce mill had. There were a lot of really good blue collar jobs and most of the kids I grew up with, you know, you had the, the management staff at the pulp mill, on the, they were the elite in town, and then you had the blue collar people, and the town was full of blue collar people. Government was not a huge factor in town. Forest service, eh, they had a lot of people in town to manage the forest because the mill was operating. Um, minimal amount of tourism. Um, I remember as a teenager, we'd get a few ships in town and you know progressed from the fair sea and the, the princess pat before that <clears throat> and the fair sea and prince george arcadia uh and there was then the, they started the love boat and, and the princess cruises would come up but the, it wasn't a big industry it was just some ships that would visit a few people they'd leave that's probably the biggest change is the cruise industry, industry and how it's impacted the town. And, and I don't believe it's been a positive impact. Well, I, I'm glad I asked. Uh, one of the exhibits that's going to be coming up in the next, I think, four or five years is, is all about the waterfront and kind of how it's changed. Of course, Murphy's Landing is part of that and the Murphy family. Um, uh, are there any stories you'd like to share about fishing or working with your dad? Anything that comes to mind that you'd like to share? Oh. <laughs> well, I can't share some of them. Um, I'll let you curate that, that for us. Well, I really enjoyed fishing with my granddad. 
Spike Murphy was was a gem of a human being. Um, he was tough, tough as nails, um, but he was also um, a kind and gentle man. Um, my dad was a friend to everybody, never met a stranger, but he was oftentimes pretty rough on his crew. And that's where I fished with him for quite a long time, but then at some point, and it happens with most father-sons, that you diverge a little bit. You have your way of doing things. They have their way of doing things. I didn't appreciate the way that he treated his crew. He had this one little thing where if you didn't know what he knew after 40 years in the business, in your one year in the business, if you didn't know what he knew, then you were a dumbass. And he wasn't afraid to call people that. <laughs> I didn't go on with that. I, I remember back in late 80s, um, I got a phone call. I, I ended up having a career in emergency services, but I was still fishing in the summertime. And I remember getting a call one day that uh, they had to bring dad to town and I need to take some time off <clears throat> and go out and run the boat because he was going to be laid up for a while, kidney stones or something. So we had, had a crew on the boat, had my sister and my brother. My brother was running skiff, and um, I think there was three other people on the boat. And we went out, and we started fishing. And I'd never run the boat before um, actually making a set. And here I am, all of a sudden I'm captain for the day, and we had a three-day opening. We deck loaded two of the first three days, which was pretty rare for us. We just got lucky. But we're fishing with one other boat, Mark Nugent on the Hale of Wawa, and we're banging out sets. We're right in Carolina. And uh, after the, on the third day, the cook comes up and he goes, Kevin, the crew is exhausted, but they'll keep going. And the only reason I can attribute that to is I, I was different in the way I approached the crew from my dad. I was encouraging. After every set, I'd come back on the back of the house, and if something had gone wrong or haywire, I'd, I'd say, okay, well, this happened, we need to do this. If that happens again, we need to do it this way. you know. And I appreciated the fact that they were busting their butt so hard for us. And that made a big difference. Uh, and the, the cook said, you know, they were talking to the cook, it was Larry Holcomb. And uh, that made a big, big difference in the way that I learn to treat people. Um, I love fishing with my dad because he had stories. Yeah, I mean, he, he was an encyclopedia of catch can history. Um, he was born in 1937 and he could tell you things that happened in 1920. I mean, he just, he grew up around the old timers. His first trip on a boat, he was three months old. So he grew up on the Rio um, and he remembered everything. He just had a memory that just was unbelievable when it came to people and events. I remember one time we were in uh, Hawaii. We went there in the wintertime sometimes. And he heard this laugh. And we're in, on Maui. And he goes, that's Mary Howard. Old catch can family. Hadn't seen her in years. He goes around the corner and sure enough, Mary Howard. <laughs> <laughs> he just, he knew things. I mean, just he knew people and he knew things. Um, and he always had stories. So it was, it was fun to be on the boat with him. I, and uh, I know he, he enjoyed having me on the boat. Uh, he'd never tell me he enjoyed it, but I'd hear it from other people. <laughs> he was not one with, uh, with a lot of praise for anybody, even family. So. <laughs> and now the, the Rio Grande, is that, and, and you guys can correct me wrong, because I get to play the not growing up in catch a can like y'all y'all. Um, the Rio Grande serves as the model that's the Arctic Bars boat, is that correct? It's served as a model for the Rio Grande. Oh, okay. That Terry Richardson built that model uh, for my dad's 80th birthday. And uh, so I, I was able to give that to him. Uh, Terry, Terry cut me a deal on it. <laughs> well, he's a fantastic model maker. I mean, you've, you've seen you know, yeah. what's up there and, and we're able to put on display. He did make a mistake on it, but I don't beat him up too bad on that. <laughs> the shape of the stern is wrong. Yes. 
I thought so too. <laughs> he I, made he made it flat. Yeah. Yeah. That's the only thing he messed up. I thought so too, but I wasn't gonna say a word. No, nope. it's beautiful. That, that was the first thing that caught my eye. Yeah. Go, Terry, you, you got this turn wrong. Yeah. Well, are there any other like hidden gems in that model that we should look for? Well, there's a signature thing for Terry. The, the coffee mug. The coffee mug. Yes. Yeah. And from experience, on top of the deck winch is never a place to put your coffee mug. Because <laughs> the boat vib vibrates so much, it wouldn't stay there for very long. <laughs> yeah. there. Well, um, are there any questions? I mean, we're, we're right approaching, you know, a little bit over an hour, so you know, we won't keep you guys captive. Um, but are there questions you wished we'd asked you about the Rio Grande or just your time here? I, I can't think of any. I mean, I can tell you about the change in the machinery on it. Um, originally, she had an 80 horsepower Washington, um, and it did eight knots. Progressively went to a 310 horsepower V8 Detroit. She made eight knots. So I don't know if the horses were bigger back in the day <laughs> <laughs> or what the deal was. <laughs> But the, the flywheel on that 80 horsepower Washington was so big, it stood about that tall, about that thick of solid iron. When they took that engine out, they had to pour a lot of concrete in the hull of the boat to get it to sit back down where it was stable. Yeah. But, and that engine stayed around town for a long time. But, uh, yeah, it's... It, so, of course, I'm going to want to take pictures of the Rio. Can I get on her or... The decks goes? are pretty soft. Okay. All right. Yeah, and it's the cabin is okay. kind of falling in a little maybe bit. I'll, I'll take pictures, you know, just from around it, and then maybe I'll see if I can get up on porch or something, get level so I can look into it. Yeah. I don't, I don't if you give it. me your email, okay. I can send you some pictures of it. Yeah. Back, oh, Actually, back if you want to send those directly to Erica or Bailey. Bailey? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, I have that. Yeah, and since we have Ben here, and we have you as a captive audience too, Ben, is there something while we have Kevin as an audience or you know interview, and, and he's given us some stories, something that we should have him tell, you know, talk about? Anything off the top of your head? How many times did he rescue you? <laughs> 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 we cut the tape on though. Yeah. <laughs> There's a. Well, is if you, if you run around on a boat in this country long enough, you're going to do one of two things. You're either going to break down or you're going to run up on the beach. Just a matter of time. And um, I got my day when I was towing a float to the Unic River. And my reduction gear went out on me. And Sonner... It was just a phone call away. Sent her run the boat all the way up to a place called Clue Bay, where I wound up, and towed me back to town. And uh, I thought I had the reduction gear fixed, so I ran, got aboard, and we ran back to pick that float up and get it up the Unic River, which we did. And then when I got to the Unic River, I broke down again. <laughs> it was not a good trip at all. <laughs> So then Pete Amundsen come and got me the second trip. And it proves that no good deed goes unpunished because you were doing Bob a favor That's it. by towing the That's floor. right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I would not, uh, to, I have a place in Charlie Sound mm -hmm. and I wanted you guys to talk to Rich and Kay about it. Oh, for sure. Um, it's, the <coughs> it's the original site of the Sunny Point Cannery which wound up where the shipyard is today. Um, but in 1917, August 17th, I believe it was, oh, 19, 1917, there was a fire. I got pictures from the museum of the fire. They're copyrighted pictures. Mm -hmm. I bought them from, from you guys. And it shows pictures of the fire. It, it's still burning. And then I got um, I got the information from Pat Rappel. Yeah. And I was working with her when she was writing the book. And um, I have a lot of information about Sunny Point Cannery Number One 
and Chalmers Sound. For sure. Okay. So it, that property was bought and uh, then resold. And I have one of the, I, have, I actually have four lots. And, but at any rate, what I'm leading up to is I would not be there today if it wasn't for the Rio Grande because every stick of lumber, I mean, every can of gas, you name it, and originally everything went on the Rio and Sunder never charged me a penny. It was, it, you know, I mean, I went held at fishing with him a couple of times, you know, to help pay for my, to get my, all my stuff over there, but he, he brought everything. So uh, I'm very grateful for that because that's really God's country. 